You are now listening to British Brothers, the True Crime Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this week we are neither covering a British murder case or a horror story. I have a guest on this week, she is a frequent collaborator, this will be her fifth appearance, you may well know who she is. From Killer Stories, please welcome Bobby Holmes. Thank you Stu, always love coming on with you. Welcome back. Briefly, for those who may not have heard your episodes before, do you want to just tell everyone who the hell you are? Who the hell I am? Well, I I just celebrated my two year podcast anniversary, um, and every thank you. Every week, I usually every week I'm taking a break right now. I kind of changed it from weekly to doing seasons, but I don't I don't have one set of genre that I stick to. I'll cover any true crime case, so I take suggestions from my listeners. And so I will cover unsolved mysteries to murder cases, basically. So, and, nice. and we've covered some really interesting ones on your show previously. <laughs> yeah. Suggestions. <laughs> suggestions. That's right. I say things very, I don't know, not even American, very Bobby. <laughs> yeah. And I, I can't let it go, Mm-mm. which some people, one particular person has picked fault with but never mind it's okay just try to be nice still we'll i'll be, try we'll be fine recently i was on bobby's show killer stories and i told the story of david fuller i'm not going to spoil the story but if you're from the uk you may have heard of it it was recently in the news a year or so ago check out bobby's episode with me on there it's a great story we had a lot of fun and now it's bobby's turn we do this every time we record to come on my show when we're recording this it's the end of june But as you hear this, dear listener, it's July 21st. So two days ago, it was my 33rd birthday. Oh, well, happy birthday. So feel free to buy me a beer or send me some birthday love. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. And your, your story had quite the twist. Mine's got a twist too. Yeah. Let's hope I reach my birthday now. That's, I don't want to jinx things. (laughs) God, imagine. <laughs> Just be very, very careful until then. At least reach your birthday. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. So <laughs> how this is going to work is Bobby is going to tell me and you, the listener, a story. I have no idea what the story is or what it's about. It's the best way to go into these things. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Bobby Holmes. Well, thank you. This is called the Tall Hot Blonde Case or a Catfish Murder. And it takes place, or I should say it starts in 2005, which is the year I graduated high school. And you would have been 15 or 16, 16. I also graduated high school, but we call them different things. (laughs) Right. Okay. Well, they don't graduate from high school, right? Isn't that what you told me? No, we graduate. graduate. We finish high school. Finish it. Okay. Yeah. At 16, but you go on till 18, I believe. Yes, about 17, 8. I was 18. Give me a diploma. I finished high <laughs> Pretty school. Pretty expected of you. Hey, a lot of people <laughs> around here don't. They they do the GED route. Do you guys have that equivalent? GED. So well, we got we of, got a college after high school between 16 and 18. No, this is the equivalent of a high school diploma. So if you drop out or fail out, you have the chance to finish online tests, I guess, and get your GED. I have no idea what you're talking no, about now. That's because you guys all like finish school <laughs> like normal yep. people. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you said it, not me. So anyways... At this time, MySpace and Facebook were just emerging, but chat rooms like Pogo were really popular, and I've never heard of Pogo, but I do remember as a tween, my friend and much older, cooler sister was always in a chat room, and when she wasn't there, my friend and I would totally log in under her profile and pretend to be her. (laughs) Did you ever get into chat rooms? We did chat room. I can't remember what any were called, but yeah, used to go online and 
chat, but it dangerous as, as a teen. <laughs> right. I mean, we had ICQ and is it ASL? I don't know, where you could like talk to your friends, but this is more like getting in and talking to strangers. Yeah, an online thing, yeah. Right. But, and that's one thing, ASL, that's what we would ask each other. Yeah. Like, ASL question mark, which stood for age, sex, location. <laughs> mm. and, and I guarantee no one told the truth about any of that, at least not their location, if they were smart. And the age was always a lie. Oh, yeah. I'm like 13 pretending to be 18 for sure. <laughs> Jesus. That's just what we were doing. But Thomas Montgomery was a 46-year-old father of two. And after 16 years of marriage, he felt a bit bored with his current life, and he found an escape from reality in the Pogo chat room. He created an alter ego, Tommy, which was not a complete fabrication. It started as a, just a younger version of himself. He was in the Marines at one time, so he, com he claimed to be an 18-year-old about to be deployed to Iraq. And Tommy's screen name was Marine Sniper, and he met 17-year-old Jesse, tall, hot, blonde. And she sent him a message asking if, they, if he wanted to be friends, and he sat behind the keyboard and created more details of his new persona. 6'2", 190 pounds, a black belt in karate, <laughs> like all Dream the things water. you want to hear, right? <laughs> um, he sent an old photo of himself, like back when he actually had hair. Apparently at this point, he's already kind of balding. How old was he, sorry, when he was doing um, 46. Okay. 46, well, he's yeah. turning to be 18. Okay. Uh-huh, and he's talking to a 17-year-old girl. So she says. She's a minor, yes. <laughs> so... He told Jesse, he's making up this story, right? His mother died of cancer when he was 12. His father was in the military, which is why he decided to join the Marines. And not long after they started chatting, Tom pretended to be deployed to Iraq, yet continued to chat daily with Jesse. So she seemed pretty naive. She didn't really ask questions about how he had so much free time to spend <laughs> online while serving in the Middle East. But he supposedly experienced some tragic events while there and shared thoughts of suicide with Jesse. And we don't know if Thomas really felt this way or he was just making up a story as Tommy, but she pleaded with him not to do it. She needed him, she said. And hearing those words turned things around for Tommy. He said Jesse was the best thing that ever happened to him, and it brought them even closer. <laughs> They took their relationship to the next level, and Jesse started sending photos to Tommy. Now, she wasn't completely nude, but she was seductively posing in her bikini, and she was technically a minor, and he knew that, but Thomas kept up the conversation with her, and it soon turned explicit. And within a few months of chatting, Jesse considered Tommy to be her boyfriend. A very jealous boyfriend. Even though Thomas was the one flat out lying, he accused Jesse of sending photos to other men on the internet. And she assured Tommy that he was the only one, but in an attempt to, at an apology, she sent him a package, like in the mail, to his house. And why people give out their actual address, I, I don't I thought you were going to say she sent it to Iraq then. No, right? Okay, so this is the thing. <laughs> he told her that... He gave her his address, and he said that it was a pickup location for the military mail that would then be forwarded to him in Iraq. <laughs> I live on number one, Iraq Street, Iraq. <laughs> Pretty naive, right? So in the package that Jesse sent to Tommy was a necklace, a silver chain, and it had a key pendant, which was to represent that Tommy had the key to her heart. <laughs> but there was more. Jesse also sent a pair of sexy underwear. And like I said, it's just weird that she would believe that, you know, sending it to this location would just be forwarded on to Iraq. But anyways, and then he got it so fast. <laughs> she didn't ask for images back off him then. Well, I mean, he sent that one. He he may have just continued to send old pictures of himself, but you would think you can tell, oh, these are like, I guess it is 2005. Maybe people are still scanning photos in, but you know, you can tell when mm. a photo's old. Like he would have been really young 
when he but he actually, the pictures he sent were actually of him they weren't just some kid Correct. online no okay. they, he sent like pictures of himself when he was a younger okay. dude in the marines is what i gathered but in december of 2005 after eight months of chatting online tommy asked jesse to marry him and she said yes and instead of the typical engagement ring, Tommy sent Jesse poinsettias. <laughs> poinsettias. <laughs> yeah, you it's know in the flowers. Uh huh. Uh, and I'm not gonna lie, I'd be pretty pissed at getting Christmas flowers <laughs> versus <laughs> like a diamond, because <laughs> that's like what you put out at Christmas time. I don't know if yeah. you guys do, but that's what we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're poisonous to animals. Hmm. I don't know if you knew that, but no. She reciprocated by sending more lingerie, and she had a dog tag, like a military dog tag. She had it engraved saying, Tom and Jesse, always and forever. So apparently now they are engaged. And I don't understand these internet relationships where people decide to get married before even meeting each other face to face. I know a lot of couples meet online these days, but this instance just kind of seems strange. Especially being like young, attractive teenagers. I mean, have they ever talked on the phone or anything? Yeah, not yet. They do. They get there, but I, okay. I think at this point they're literally just chatting with each other. But I mean, teenagers, especially. I mean, you're seeing tall, hot blonde, and she's sending pictures, and she's hot, and this young marine, and he's hot. They, at that age, you have raging hormones. You want to be physical, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> not just like you know, on the internet with strangers. But anyways. Once engaged, they started talking on the phone. 10 minutes every morning, 10 minutes every evening. And we can only assume this was on Thomas's drive to and from work because he's got to hide his cyber fiance from his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so he kept his current wife in the dark, but didn't hold back at work. He told all of his friends about his younger love interest. He said he planned on leaving his family and moved to West Virginia, which is where Jesse lived, to be with her. And apparently he thought if he showed up and met her in person, she would just accept him as a 46-year-old man instead of an 18-year-old Marine. I don't really know what mm -hmm. he's thinking here, but this gets really weird. He began a mental transformation from Thomas to Tommy. He took out a notebook and he wrote down, on January 2nd, 2016, Tom Montgomery ceases to exist and will be replaced with 18-year-old Battles Guard Marine. <laughs> he is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. I, mean, I guess I just thought if he wrote it down, it would make it true. I don't really know. He's also writing it like down in the third person. So yes. he's clearly <laughs> confused about who the hell he is. Yes. And he went on to write about his plan to leave his wife and children with a million dollars. But the main problem there is that he did not have a million dollars. I guess he's like, oh, they'll be fine. I'll leave them with a million dollars. He mm. doesn't, doesn't. Bit of an issue that. if you don't have any money. <laughs> right. I mean, we just kind of touched on this, but it's obvious that Tom has some mental health issues going on. Clearly, I, yeah. I mean, I know lots of people catfish and make things up, but this is like, you know, people who lie so much that they start believing it themselves. Yeah. I don't I don't know if that's what's going on in his head, but he is not 18. <laughs> and she would notice that when he showed up, I'm sure. You'd think so. But his wife, Cindy, was in the dark about his affair and plans to leave, but she noticed an obvious change in Tom. The moment he walked through the door getting home from work, he didn't even bother to say hello. He just walked straight to his computer. And she felt them growing apart day by day, but what bothered her the most was the lack of attention that their girls were getting from their father. So she had a hunch that Tom was cheating on her and began looking through things to, to find proof. She found the underwear that Jesse sent in the mail, as well as some handwritten letters. And after reading them, she discovered he wasn't just having an affair. He was pretending to be someone he wasn't, and his new woman was a minor, 17 years old. Cindy, his wife, was disgusted, and she felt the proper way to deal with this was to write Jesse a letter, and she explained that Tommy was actually 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery, he was married, had two daughters, and their relationship was a sham. Cindy told her that, you know, she, you're actually closer to our daughter's age than Tom, <laughs> mm. and 
she called her husband out and she, you know, he's a child predator and warned her to be more careful with who she talks to online. So Cindy mails this letter along with a family photo and hoped that that would just be the end of things. She confronted Tom. He's sleeping on the couch <laughs> for the unseeable future <laughs> until they figured things out. Yeah. Um, I mean, could you imagine? I just don't even know what I would do if I stumbled across that. It's hard to hear that it was even neglecting spending time with his kids. I know. It's sad. Like he, all his life is focused on, on chatting with this girl online. So bad. Cause you can tell in that, if someone starts acting different towards you, you can tell. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not, not that he was trying to hide it or anything. Like he would clearly just walk in and didn't even say hi and went to the computer. Oh, yeah. But when Jesse received the letter, she was confused as to how Tommy could do this to her. You know, they were engaged, they were in love, all this stuff. She didn't want to believe it. So she immediately logs into Poco and there's this guy, Brian Barrett, who she knows him as Tommy's online poker buddy. But what she didn't know is that Brian actually worked with Tom at the Dynabraid factory. I think it's like tools or something that they make, but they work together at this factory. And she okay. gets on and she asks Brian if it was true that Tommy was lying to her. And he knew that Jesse was younger, but he had no idea that she was only 17 and that Tom was like lying about his identity. He just thought, oh, Thomas has this online affair with a younger woman. Like he had no idea to the extent of it, right? So he spills the beans, confirming that Tommy was actually 46-year-old Tom. So his colleague's profile is real, like he's his yes. own age. His own, right. Yeah, I okay. believe so, yeah. Everything he's doing is the truth. And he's 22, so he's much younger, okay, um, that makes closer sense. to the age of Jesse. Ooh, um, there's a clue see, in there somewhere. Right, you can see okay. where that's going. Uh -huh. So she's all horrified and upset, and he tries to comfort her. Because she felt so betrayed and they have that common person, you know, Tom. <laughs> so he's trying to comfort her and they start chatting regularly on Pogo. And both Jesse and Brian got into the chat room and they kind of announced, you know, this guy's a fake. He's a child predator. They're just like warning everybody. And then back at work, Brian's doing the same thing. He's humiliating Tom in front of everyone at work, everyone they know, kind of ruining his reputation, right? So Brian and Jesse's relationship is kind of now blossoming, and she sent him the same racy photos that she sent Tom, apparently not learning her lesson the first time. It's really upsetting to hear because there's, I don't know if it's an issue with, I don't want to say she's been raised poorly, but there's just something there that she should know better than this. Yeah. Like at 17, she's in here. We class an adult as someone who's 18, which is still so young. Yeah, it is. And and it's one thing to maybe send it to your boyfriend that you know in person and trust. And even at that age, probably I would not advise doing that because it'll come out at school and everyone will see you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it happens. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard to hear that, you know, she, that she feels the need to do that for whatever reason. Yeah. So Tom sends Jesse a message <sighs> again saying that he wants to commit suicide. And who knows, maybe this time it's true because he's like feeling like his life is falling apart. But she knows he's a fraud. She still shows sympathy for him. She urged him not to do it. And she told Tom she would always love Tommy. <laughs> and I'm not even sure how to take that. It's like, I don't love you. I love the idea of you, you know, the mm. pretend you. <laughs> Kicking the teeth. The story will continue after these quick messages. And now, back to the story. Uh, listen to how weird this is. This is the conversation between Tommy, Tom, whatever, and Jesse on Poco. So, tall, hot blonde, I ache to be with Tommy. Do you miss it, Tom? <laughs> More than you will ever know, says Tom. My heart aches to hear you call me your Tommy. <laughs> Jesus. I can't even get through this without laughing. But then he says, I wish I could be that 19-year-old Marine for you. And then she says, I know, Tom. But isn't that just like so strange? So weird. That's just... Yeah. I know. Very weird. It's like, 
I want you to just go back to being that person you were pretending to be. And well, what she should have said was, was, fuck off, you dirty old bastard. Yes. You know, it's what yes. she should have said. Uh-huh. So Tom was getting pushback from everyone in his life. His wife, Jesse, all his coworkers. He was angry all the time. He sent mean messages to Jesse, calling her derogatory names and accusing her of sexing, uh, sexting other men, specifically Brian. And at work, he was threatening his coworkers, and he scared them enough that one person actually wore a bulletproof vest to work. And <laughs> I don't think I would continue working there if I was in that much fear that I, I had to wear a bulletproof vest to work every day, right? Turn him into HR or get another job. That's kind of scary. I wouldn't even know where to get a bulletproof vest. Mm, I don't know, Amazon? <laughs> I also wouldn't know where to get a gun. Which is the yeah. more prominent thing. Yes. This would not be an issue there, I guess, right? Well, assuming he's going to get him with a gun. What if he comes at you with a knife? Here's a question. Are bulletproof vests mm -hmm. one and the same as stab-proof vests? I don't know. I picture stab-proof being like chain metal. like Because uh... I think our, our cops here wear stab-proof vests, I would have thought, rather than bulletproof. Mm-hmm. What do they look like? They're just like the same as bulletproof vests, I guess, but probably chain link, so you can't get a knife through it. Right, yeah. I mean, ours are just like black. I don't know what's inside of them. But yeah, I'm picturing like some people jousting back in the day and they wore chain metal. <laughs> <laughs> so I imagine it's a, lot, a little bit more stylish than that, but yeah, same <laughs> concept. Yeah, Knife crime is the big one here. Right. But Jesse, at this point, decides enough was enough, and to get revenge on Tom, she flaunted her relationship with Brian. They made plans to meet in person, and Brian couldn't wait to rub this in Tom's face. At work, he was telling everyone that he was traveling to West Virginia to meet Jesse, the tall, hot blonde, which it drives me nuts. I know I sent you, I was writing it, I don't know if you noticed that there was only one L in tall hot blonde mm. but perhaps t-a-l-l -L yeah t-a-l-l -L hot blonde was already taken maybe i don't know i asked Stu downloads all the free things for me and i was like can you download tall hot blonde he's like this sounds like a porno <laughs> i was like don't watch it just send it to me because you know nothing you know nothing yeah, about this. I couldn't get it, so I'd, I'd yeah, I haven't seen anything. Right. I didn't I didn't get to watch it either. But apparently there is a movie remake and a documentary about this if you wanted to check it out. But Tom, at this point, you know, they're flaunting this in front of him. He's irate. Jesse is supposed to be his, and they planned a life together, and now Brian is taking it all from him. But they get together that Brian and Jesse never happened. They had a huge fight. Jesse was claiming that he didn't really care about her, that he only wanted sex, and she canceled their meeting. So after this, Jesse messaged Tom. She told him that she missed Tommy. She knows he wasn't real, but he was the person behind the keyboard, and that is who she enjoyed talking to. So he agreed to continue chatting with her under one condition, break all ties with Brian. And he warned her what he would do if she did. He would make Brian pay for it. She swore to Tom that the only reason that she started talking to Brian was to make him jealous and that she was going to end things. I just don't even know what Tom's expecting out of this relationship. Like, why? Why continue this? It really is high school shit, isn't it? It is. At 46. Because even after Jesse learned the truth about Tom, she goes right back to dating and, so, and sending provocative messages. So it's not just that they're chatting. They're like, Sending pictures and explicit things to each other again, and I mean, what? So he's sending them even though she knows he's an old, well, not an old man, but a middle aged man. Yeah, uh huh. So he's sending her explicit pics of himself as a forty six year old. I don't now. know if he's sending the explicit pics, but like they are sexting each other. Okay, like, and she knows who he is at this point. Is the, is the <laughs> right? Yeah, thing. yeah. And I'm sure right. she was sending more photos of herself, but I don't know. Jesus. Yeah, she'd be like, um, excuse me, that's a 46-year-old dick. I can tell. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Sorry, I thought that was funny. <laughs> At least you're laughing. <sighs> so, 
Not only did he have an online feud going on with Brian, but he had to see him every day at work as well. And he started referring to Brian as his enemy and told Jesse that he was preparing for war. He started working out every day to get back in shape. But his mood was just completely unpredictable. One minute he would be sweet talking Jesse, and the next accusing her of cheating on him and flooding her screen with verbal abuse. And you would think that this would be the point. Like he's he's hot cold, Doctor. I don't even know how to say this, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde. Doctor Jekyll and Mister okay. Hyde. <laughs> Anyways, he's he he's unpredictable, and you think she would break things off now, but she kept it going, promising that he's the only one. Where did he live again? I don't know if I have that written down. Because I'm thinking she know. probably carried this on because they were so far away. If she's in West Virginia and he's... Mm -hmm. I don't know why New York and is popping into my head, but I'm not positive, to be honest. Far enough away that you'd think she's right. it's not safe like, enough to carry on. Yes, right. But, I mean, she, he probably had her address because he sent her something. I feel like... Oh, poinsettias. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so he knows where she lives. Uh, but he starts stalking her profile on Pogo. So I think you can see who's in what chat room and all this. So you can be in multiple chat rooms talking to multiple different people. And he finds her in a specific chat room that also has Brian in it. So, mm. yeah. So, you know, shit hit the fan. He's pissed. He threatens her, saying she should be afraid, but Brian was the one in real physical danger here. Not just verbal abuse through a computer screen, but like he knows where Brian is. He knows where he works because they work together. He's the one in real danger. And she tried to calm him down. There was just no use to that. She warned Brian that Tom was hostile and threatening to hurt him, but Brian wasn't intimidated by Brian. Um, you know, old man Brian. <laughs> <laughs> he's only 22, young and stupid, and he's like, whatever. But after a while, Jesse just stopped responding to Tom on Pogo. So then he texts her on her phone. And then that goes without response. He calls her. Doesn't answer her cell phone. He calls her house phone. And he starts screaming at her when she answers. And Jesus. yeah, he's obviously off the rails. Tom knows Brian's work schedule. He sits in the parking lot and waits for him. And as he's waiting, he casually eats a peach and throws the pit on the ground. Tom slashed the tire of Brian's pickup truck so he wouldn't have a chance to get away. At 10.16 p.m., Brian clocks out and leaves the building. Tom held a 30 caliber rifle, so you're right, it is a gun, <laughs> and watched 22-year-old Brian Barrett walk across the lot. He hopped into the driver's seat, but before he could put his key in the ignition, Tom fired three shots through the window, killing him instantly. Then he just drives home. The first thing Tom did was log on to talk to Jesse. <laughs> and he asks her if she had talked to Brian lately, but he didn't tell her what he'd done. I think he was just kind of like, wait till you see what I've done kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Two whole days passed before anyone discovered Brian's body. His truck was in the parking lot over the weekend. He didn't have any scheduled plans with friends or family, so it just took a while for people to see that he was missing or that his car didn't move from the lot. So this was on, like, end of the week, I guess. Yeah, probably, like, Friday, a yeah. Friday night, and yeah. So an investigation was open to find who was responsible for his murder, and it didn't take long for them to discover the quarrel between Brian Barrett and Tom Montgomery, when interviewing Brian's co-workers, they spoke of their internet love triangle and Tom's constant threats. They found Jesse's phone number on Brian's phone and reached out to her. So they suspected Tom, even though he was nowhere to be found, but they warned her that she might be in danger. They assumed that he was possibly on his way to West Virginia to see Jesse at this point. So the local police were sent to her home to check on her. When they arrived, Jesse's mother, 45-year-old Mary Sheeler, answered the door, and she told the police that Jesse didn't live there anymore, and she didn't know where she was and had no way of reaching her. So this is the real twist, <laughs> Stu. Jeez. Jesse is a real person, but she wasn't the one talking in the chat rooms. It's her uh, mother. What? Yeah. <laughs> 
Damn. So I mean, I legit didn't see that coming. Yeah, when I first heard this too, I was like, <gasps> like jaw hit oh, the floor. So yeah, Jesse and this sold is, it so well. It gets even worse. Like <laughs> a catfish was catfishing, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I guess she wasn't too heartbroken to find out that Tommy wasn't actually Tommy. He is a forty-six-year-old man because she's yeah. even older. <laughs> yeah, but she wasn't who she's claiming to be either. But the really fucked up part, all the photos that were sent to Tom, Brian, and Lord knows who else, they were real photos of her teenage daughter, Jessie. Uh, yeah. Geez. So Mary is following her daughter around with a camera and taking pictures of her in revealing clothing and provocative poses. I don't know if like maybe some of them Jessie had on her phone and she stole them, but a lot of these pictures were taken from behind. And Jesse probably didn't even know that these photos were being taken of her. Like so candid photos rather than... Yeah. She's like, what is... I don't even know what the right word is for this, but it's so messed up. And she's... In, in the beginning, she was only 17, a minor. And she's sending like provocative pictures of her daughter to other men on the internet. So... That's so illegal. Yeah. Well, you would think. <laughs> so... I, I think it should be, but what she was doing, I mean, it's obviously inappropriate and should be illegal, but, and, and now this has all gotten a man killed. So like her involvement should play a role in this murder, I would think. And Isn't please. That, like, <laughs> what's, what's the term? Like so she's taking part in sending indecent images of a minor right? to other people. Right. I mean, I don't know if it's because it wasn't full on nude that it wasn't considered a problem, but at this point. Or like it's because it's a daughter. Right. I don't know. But police are appalled and disgusted, but they just have to wait and deal with her <laughs> once they find Tom <laughs> because that's still a problem. They need to find Tom and track him down. And once they do, they find him. He admits to being in a relationship with Jesse, but says he didn't kill Brian. He had a supposed alibi. He ate a late dinner at a restaurant and was home by 10 after 10 before Brian was killed. But Tom's wife, Cindy, is like, nah. <laughs> she knows he's shady. She's calling him out on his lie. He wasn't home until 1040. So that gave him plenty of time to commit the murder and then go home. So evidence found at the crime. There's the peach pit that has his DNA on it, as mm -hmm. well as a set of leather cartridge case. I don't know if that's like holding bullets i assume but it didn't have his dna on it but it was covered in his dog's hair <laughs> so that tied it back to him um, and his cell phone records placed him in the area at the time of the murder one of tom's guns the same gun that was used to kill brian was missing so i mean it pretty much it's oh, tom right they yeah, know it's him yeah. So he's arrested on suspicion of homicide and he didn't find out the truth about Jesse until he was behind bars. So he still thinks, you know, 18 year old Jesse is 18 year old Jesse. He doesn't know this is actually Mary <laughs> that he's been talking to this whole time. So then he realizes that he killed an innocent man for like no reason at all. He continues to de deny involvement, but his lawyer knows he's going to be convicted with this evidence stacked against him, and he advises him to take a plea deal. So he pleads guilty to second-degree manslaughter, and he was sentenced to 20 years in prison. But how is that not premeditated murder? Yeah, that doesn't He sits. Any he sat sense. outside with a gun and waited for him. Yeah. That's planned, right? Manslaughter is like... I don't know, someone comes after you and you stab them or like an, you know, like a not planned killing. I think manslaughter is more you didn't intend to kill them. Right. Or yeah, like a car accident or something. Even if it's an intentional attack, you didn't mean, like if you beat someone up outside a club and they smack their head on the floor and die, that I believe would be manslaughter. You, you intended to harm them, but not kill them. Mm -hmm. Then you've got what involuntary, which I suppose would like you say, if you accidentally knock someone over and they died, I guess. I mean, but this guy is sitting out there with a gun. Wait oh, till he gets in the first car. degree should, murder. Yeah, it should be. But I don't know if just because he like is trying to take a deal and pleading guilty, they just go with it. But 20 years doesn't really quite seem yeah. 
because you know it won't be 20. I mean, sometimes they'll say, oh yeah, life, and then it'll be 20 till they get out, but 20 will probably only be five, <laughs> you know? Is that, is that how it works? Because not for normal prison sentences here, so not murder, generally you would serve half, is my understanding, if you behaved yourself. But with murder, life is mandatory. Obviously, it doesn't mean life unless it's a whole life order. But you, when you get a minimum sentence of that life sentence, you have to serve that minimum. So if you got a minimum of 20 before you could apply for parole, you wouldn't be able to apply in 10. You would have to serve at least the minimum sentence for murder here. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It didn't say without the possibility of parole. If that, If there is, I didn't see a date for when he could do so, but I mean... Sometimes it's 20 ridiculous. years, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How, how quickly they can get out for things. It's crazy. But how everything ended up. Tom's wife, Cindy, divorced him, and his daughters wrote a letter saying that they did not plan to visit or speak to him ever again. And Mary Sheeler, Jesse's mom, was never charged with anything. What? Yep. I don't get it either, but she took on a fake identity, sent photos of her daughter to men on the internet. I don't know. I guess catfishing is not illegal, but <laughs> I don't know. Sending photos is unethical and disgusting, but apparently not illegal. What the hell? I don't understand it either. But And even though her involvement played a role in a man getting murdered, she's a free woman. Should, I wonder if her daughter ever found out and was like... Oh, yeah. Yep. So <laughs> she started catfishing because she was bored. And this is what she said. And only talked to Tom to stop him from chatting with actual teenagers, <laughs> which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Because in the beginning, Tom claimed to be 18. She didn't know he was a 46 year old man. So that like makes no sense whatsoever. But she also got divorced. Her husband divorced her. And no surprise at all, the real Jesse wants nothing to do with her. Good. Yeah. Good yeah. honor. So the murder of Brian Barrett, tall, hot, blonde case. That's so many lives ruined. I know. For nothing. Catfishing. It's just so ridiculous. That's outrageous. Yep. I, um, I kind of want to watch. So the movie, I think it was the movie, has Courtney. I'm trying to see who Courtney Cox would be. But she's in it for it's it was like a lifetime movie or something. And then there, like I said, there was a documentary as well. But yeah. Maybe she's up. his maybe she's his wife. Maybe. So I heard this on and it was a podcast special where they did like a three part there were three different crazy catfish stories um that all ended in death. <laughs> Someone dying. And this one spoke to me. It was the twist at the end, I think, that I was like, ooh, I'm going to do that one. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good uh, a killer story from the host of Killer Stories, Bobby Holmes. Thank you. So, yeah. For more of a similar style, presentation style, you should all know Bobby by now, but if you don't, <laughs> you could check out her show at Killer Stories. What are you on? You haven't got your own website, have you? I do not have my own website. Amateur. <laughs> but I do have, you know, everything's on my link tree. But link tree. anyways, which is just slash killer stories. I will link your link tree. But it's been a pleasure having you on once more. And again, if you haven't checked out my episode, which probably dropped before this, depending if Bobby pulls a finger out of her ass, <laughs> then that'll be me telling the story of David Fuller the nasty nasty bugger from the uk and this has been the story of tom what was his name tom montgomery montgomery like thomas Mr. Burns. montgomery thomas montgomery the tall hot blonde case the tall spelt with one l mm -hmm. twists and turns in this one so make sure you give bobby a like subscribe a review but yeah, that's it for this special episode of British Murders, Killer British Murder Stories Volume 5. Hopefully we'll be back at some point for a number six in the yes. future. But well. until until next time, this has been do you want to do the ending here? <laughs> this has been a killer story. Cheerio.